Today we're going to be learning Ketubot Daf Nun Tet. It's the Daf for Shabbat. Um, Mesechet Ketubot is sponsored by Erica and Rob Schwartz in honor of the 50th anniversary of Erica's parents, which is today, Shira and Steve Schachter. It is fitting that this milestone anniversary falls on the tractate of Ketubot in the discussion of the marriage contract. Their marriage, which has been filled, love, filled with love, respect, and understanding, compassion, and of course lots of humor, has been a blessing to watch and learn from. May they continue to enjoy many more years of a happy and healthy married life together until 120. Mazal Tov. We're going to get started right now with our daf. We'll do a little quick review. It's a bit of a long daf, but we'll do a quick review of where we started at the end of yesterday's daf. So we were talking about the motar, the extra money that the woman makes in it beyond her designated, what her expected salary is. Rabbi Meir says if the man designates this to Hekdesh, he can. It becomes Hekdesh. If he sanctifies it to the temple, it will be sanctified. When is this Kadosh? The Gemara asks. Emat Kadosh. Rav and Shmuel, Damar, Travayu, I'm ten lines from the bottom of Nun Chedem Abed. Rav and Shmuel both say, Motar la'achar mita Kadosh. Right? This will only be after she dies, in which case he will inherit it. Then it will become sanctified. Rav Adbar Avama, Motar Mechaim Kadosh. The Motar is already immediately sanctified. Papa Papa says, in which case? Are they arguing? If he's giving her mazonot, and in place of the mazonot he gets, now this is a whole debate we're going to see, but let's assume until now we've learned, her, she gives his, her salary, in place of that she gets mazonot. He can give her this also, which is like a weekly stipend, a monthly stipend, extra money for extra expenses. In place of that, she gives us. Why does she get that? Because she gives him the motar. So if he gave her both those things, and let's say even if we interchange and say one goes for the other, the other goes for the other, he gave her both. So he gets both. Well, then, my time on the Mandat Marla, Hermita Kadosh, then Rav Shmuel make no sense to say after her death only, he, the, all those objects are his right now. If he doesn't give her either of those things, well, then he doesn't have rights to any of them, and how could it possibly be that right now it's sanctified? So to which the Gemara answers, It must be that he gave her mazonot, he gave her one, he didn't give her the other. And then we're going to see the debate is, which goes for which in place of what? So let's see, he gave her food, but he didn't give her the weekly extra stipend for extra items to buy, you know, for her to buy. Like an, an allowance, that's the word I was looking for. He doesn't give her a weekly allowance in addition to the food. This is what we've understood until now. The mizonot come in place of her salary. And that amount of money he gives her for that allowance is in place of the extra money. So since he didn't, Kevin de lo kayavla ma'akesef, since he didn't give her the ma'akesef, that extra money, motar didahave, the extra goes to her. Rav Adabar Avasa, and therefore, when he sanctifies it, it only sanctifies after death. Rav Adabar Avasaval, tiknu mizono tacha motar u ma'akesef tacha ma'aseyadeh, it's the reverse. The mizono are in place of the extra money and that she makes beyond her salary. And the ma'ak kesef, that weekly stipend he gives her, is in place of her salary. The came de kayav la mezone, and remember, in this case, he gave her mezono, but he didn't give her the ma'ak kesef. Since he gave her mezono, the motar didehave, the motar is his right now, and that's why it becomes sanctified immediately. But my plea, what's the root of their debate? Mar savar midi dishchech, midi dishchech. Uh, the first opinion, Rav and Shmuel hold, it's the typical for the typical, the thing that goes all the time. Every day she has salary, everyone gets salary, or at least assuming she's working, and there, and everyone needs mazona. But the extra allowance, not, every, not everybody needs to get that, and not everybody makes extra money in their, uh, beyond the designated amount. So therefore, it makes sense to match those two things up. Umar Safar, midi de kids, midi de kids. The other one holds, Adabar Ava says, no, it's anything that has a set amount. No, Masei Adayim has a set amount that we're going to see in the Mishnah Samach Dalet. And it's going to be quoted in a minute. That there's, the Mishnah says, if you do a particular job, you get a particular amount of money for that job. 
And anything beyond that particular amount of money is going to be the motel. So therefore, that's a set amount. The motar is not a set amount. It could be, you can make a lot more, you can make a little more. And the ma'a kesef, ma'a is a, is a measurement of money. It's a particular amount of money. Whereas mizono has, right, it could be a lot, it could be a little, it depends how much you eat. Remember we saw that woman who ate so much food and the, inher- right, the heirs were worried what's going to happen when we have to feed her, right? She eats so much. So that's an undefined amount. Now we're going to start with a question against either opinion. First question, Nega Rav Ada, Rava, Metive. Tik numizono tachamase ada. It says in the, in the Brayta, we saw this Brayta before, and this is what we've always seen, the mizono are in place of her salary. So how could you possibly say it's in place of the ma'akesef? So they say, I'm sorry, it's in place of the motar. No mistake, got confused for a second. It's in place of, right, the mizonot. She gets food. She has to give her extra money. Can't say that. It's not what it says here. Oh, when it says it means add the word motal before that in the Brayta. It really means the extra money beyond her salary. Right? Instead of saying salary, it really meant beyond her salary. You might say that's a bit of a stretch, but you're going to see that according to Robin Shmuel, they have to read a Mishnah like that because otherwise it doesn't make sense according to their opinion. Tashma, let's look at the Mishnah on Daf Samachdal and Amubet. That's the Mishnah where it says how much money the woman generally makes in particular jobs, and therefore, you know, what would be the, what's considered the Masay Adain. Tashma, let's learn from here. And this is support of Ravada and against Shmua, and against Rav and Shmua. If he doesn't give her the ma'ak kesef, that extra weekly allowance, then the ma'aseya deha go to her. She gets her salary. So what do you see here? Salary is in place of the extra money, not the, right, not the mizono. So ema motar ma'aseya deha shala. You'd have to say here it means the extra. To which they say, but wait, but the next line in that Mishnah, ha'ala katane, this is what I mentioned before, mahi osalo. What does it mean, ma'asei adayim? Now, this is going to be a problem because we want to say that the line, the words before meant the extra to the to her salary. Now they're saying, what is her salary? What, what, how do we determine what her salary is? Mishkach hamesh slaim shti biyuda. She does the shti, right? It's part of the weaving process. So it's five slaim in Judea. So, so how could it be? There, we're defining what the Masaya Daim are. We'll understand that all better when we get there on Samach Dalit. But the main point here is we have a long daf, so I want to try to keep um, what's important for our purposes. The main thing is, right after it says Masaya Deha, which we want to say is the additional, it starts talking about the basic salary. What is considered a basic salary? To which we have an easy answer to this question. Hachi Kama. Masaya Deha Kama Have Dilida Motar Dida Kama. How do you know what the additional amount is if you don't know what the basic amount is? So in order to determine the additional amount, you have to know what the basic amount is to know what's going to be considered additional. So therefore, and then it says, right, right, and there they do a comparison of what it is in Judea and the comparison to the Galil. Anyway, that's not important for our purposes. The point is, you could explain that mission is when it says Masayadeh, it really means the Motar Masayadeh. So, to each opinion, Rav Ada and Rav and Shmuel, we had to take either the Brayta or the Mishnah and change the words Masay Adayim to Motar Masay because those two sources don't work in together either which way. Because one says it's the Me'a Kesef in place of the extra money that she gives, and the other says it's Mizono in place of the, of the, sorry, they both say it's in place of the salary. The Ma'a Kesef is in place of the salary, or the Mizono is in place of the salary. So in one of the places, you're going to have to add the word Motel. Each one does it in the place that matches his opinion. Okay, next, Amr Shmuel. Going back to the Mishnah now, we had a Machloket about, until now we've been dealing with Rabbi Meir, who says it's hektish. Now we're going to get into Rabbi Yochanan Asanba, who says the Motar, the extra money she makes beyond her salary, is Chulin. To which we see, Amr Shmuel, Halachak Rabbi Yochanan Asanba. He holds like Rabbi Yochanan Asamlar. And now we're going to deal with Rabbi Yochanan Asamlar's position. Why is it Chulin? The assumption is of the commentary, commentaries that Rabbi Yochanan Asamlar is saying, Okay? What's the issue here? The motar is not yet in existence. 
So now, in a second, I just want to see something. No. Okay. Um, right. If you look in, I was trying to find which Rashi. Mi Amar Shmuel Hachi. If you look in the Rashi, Mi Amar Shmuel Hachi, about 10 lines from the top, go down a few lines to the middle of the Rashi. Al Matama, the riddle of that Rashi. Al Matama de Rabbi Yochanan Mishum Davar Shalom Bala Olamu. Shadayin lo meta, ve'en lo rishup imotal, ho'il ve'en o ma'alela me'a kesef. We're going to assume that what he's saying is, the motar is not his yet. Why is it not his? Because he didn't give her me'a kesef, so the motar is not his. It'll only be his upon death. Since it's not his now, it'll only be his upon death. So basically, we can't allow him to have rights to it, to sanctify it. So it's chulin. That's what he says. So Shmuel holds like Rabbi Yochanan Asamlar, to which the Gemara says, "Umi Amar Shmuel Hachi." Did Shmuel really say this? Vahatz nan konam shani osel apicha enot zarich lafil. Okay, we're going to have a Mishnah with three different opinions. Okay, and then we're going to see Shmuel holds like one of the opinions, and that opinion is going to indicate that Shmuel thinks you can be makne davar shelo bala olam. Okay, you can own something, have rights to it, sanctify it even. Okay, because it's like a sanctification, which is konam. Konam is a language of a neder, where I'm forbidding a vow. I'm forbidding something. Now, either I could say I'm forbidding something of mine on you, or I'm forbidding something of yours to me. It's a personal one, as opposed to hektesh. Hektesh, I'm saying this is sanctified to the temple. That means nobody can benefit from it at all, only the temple. But if I say konam, it's saying you can't benefit from something of mine, or I can't benefit from something of yours. So if you say, konam shani picha, should the husband annul the vow? Why? Because what she's basically saying is, what I make will be forbidden to you. Now the husband, right, needs to have access to any, right, anything she makes is basically his. We learned that already because he gives her mazono. And also, it, it means anything she makes, he can't benefit. That's a little hard to live like that together. So comes the town of common says, you don't need to annul that vow. The husband doesn't need to annul it. Why? Because it's an irrelevant vow. Why is it irrelevant? Because she has no rights to Masay Adah. They're his. So she can't even make a vow about them. They're not his. They're not hers to make a vow. Okay? So that's easy. Rabbi Akiva Omer, Yafel, he should nullify the vow. Shema ta'adifa la oilo. Because she can make more than the Masay Adahim. She can make more salary. That's what we talked about, the motel. And that doesn't necessarily go to him, right, depending on the situation. But let's just say right now, it doesn't go to him. And therefore, that she can forbid to him, and he, better for him to get rid of a vow like that because we don't want to have things that are hers that he can't benefit from. It's a little hard to live like that. Rabbi Yochanan ben Uri Amar, and this is the important opinion for our purposes, because in a minute we're going to see that Shmuel holds like Rabbi Yochanan ben Uri, and Shmuel was the one who held like Rabbi Yochanan ben He says, Yafel, not because Shemata Difalav, but because... Maybe he'll divorce her. And then, what will happen? Once he divorces her, he no longer has rights to her Masei Adayim. So right now he has rights to them. But maybe at some future point, this is the key. It's Devar Shalom Baal Olam right now. It's going to right, gonna be something that will only happen in the future. He, and it, we're not even sure it'll happen in the future. He'll divorce her. The Masei Adayim will become hers. At that point, her Masei Adayim will be forbidden to him. And then what will happen? If he sanctifies them now, when she divorces him, the sanctification will take will will happen. And then right, it will be waiting all this time in a holding pattern. It'll take place right then. And then what will happen? Then, right, they'll be hers. He can she can then forbid. In other words, remember, she said, sorry, I hope I didn't confuse who and who. I feel like I said something wrong here. Let me just clarify. When she makes this vow, she has no rights to the Masaya Daim. They're her husbands. She can't say anything about the Masaya Daim. But when she divorces, when she gets divorced from him, they become hers. He, when now, standing now while they were married, said they'll be sanct sorry. She said they'll be sanctified, right? My Masaya Daim will be sanctified. When she said it then, it's now going to apply at the moment of divorce. Then what will happen? Why should he nullify this vow? Because in the event that that happens and they become sanctified, what will happen? She will want to, she might want to, or he might want to, really him, might want, I mean, either one of them might want, they, they're going to have to both want this, but they might want to get remarried. 
if they want to get remarried, at this point, all her masayadayim are forbidden to him. He really can't marry her because it means he can't benefit from her at all. So basically, it's in your best interest, they say to the man, if she says such a statement, which might apply at some point in the future, when, she, when they get divorced, if they get divorced, it will apply. All of her masayadayim will be forbidden to him, and then he won't be able to remarry her. So therefore, you're better off nullifying this, this vow. Well, Amr Shmuel Halachak Rabbi Yochanan ben Uri. Now, what, is, what do you see in Rabbi Yochanan ben Uri? She's forbidding something. This is the difference, by the way, one of the differences between the two cases. They're pretty similar, but one, he is sanctifying her, masay, her motar. That was the Mishnah. And here, she is forbidding him access to her masayadayim. So it's related to the masayadayim of the woman or the motar of the woman, of the woman but it's different people doing it. So in the Mishnah, we said the motar isn't his necessarily for him to do that. Here, it's that the Masaya Daim are his, and she wants to do it, and she can't do it. But she can do it according, and it's what, what does Rabbi Yochanan Minuri say? It will be applicable later. Her statement now will affect later if she gets divorced, which means she can sanctify or dedicate or forbid something that's not in existence right now, meaning it's not hers right now. And therefore, how could she do that? According to Shmuel, when in the Mishnah, Shmuel said, you can't do that, right? If he sanctifies her stuff, her motar, the extra, which is hers, it's useless because, right, it's chulin, nothing happens. So that's the big question. We're going to have three different answers, okay? So bear with me. It's a long section. Ki Amr Shmuel, Halachak Rabbi Yochanan Menuri, Ladafa. There were three opinions, but really there were two, because the Tanakhama said you should nullify. You can't. Null, you don't need to nullify the vow. And the other two opinions, Rabbi Kiva and Rabbi Yochanan Menuri, said you fail. You should nullify the vow. So when Shmuel said Halachak Rabbi Yochanan Menuri, what he meant was nullify the vow, not because of the reason of Rabbi Yochanan Menuri, but because of the reason of Rabbi Kiva of Hadafa. Because maybe she'll make more money, and that's already in existence now, or will be in existence soon, and therefore, that that's a little better, right? Valema, okay, but that is a little difficult then, for three reasons. Either it should have said halachak Rabbi Yochanan Menuri lahadafa. If you want to say the issue is like Rabbi Yochanan Menuri that you're fair, but not for the reason of Rabbi Yochanan Menuri, but because of hadafa, you should have said that. Or inami and halachak katanakama, or you just said if you didn't want to say. You want to say, nullify the vow. Then you would say, don't hold like Tanakama. Who says you don't need to nullify the vow? Inami, and this would be the, mo- the thing you should have said first, really, which is inami, al Rabbi Akiva. If it's exactly what Rabbi Akiva said, then he should have said the halachas like Rabbi Akiva, because Rabbi Akiva said, basically, get rid of the nadir, nullify it, because of hadafat, because maybe she'll make more money. So it's very hard to answer that question, that answer. To which I'm a Rav Yosef. Rav Yosef now says, Konamot ka'amarta. One minute. You're saying konamot. Oh, and by the way, just so in case you thought about this, because I also thought about this, and Rashi addresses it. Rashi says that theoretically, if you're talking about hadafa, that's also davar shalom ba'la olam. Her extra money she's going to make is also not in existence right now. And theoretically, you could have asked the same question on Shmuel if you had given that answer and said, Yehot ha'kor b'yachan ha'min nuri, but l'hadafa, Maybe she'll make more money. That's also lo bala olam. And Rashi basically says at the end of the Rashi, Yibor Matchil Ki Amar Shmuel Halachak Rabbi Yochanan Menuri LaHadafa. He says you could have lakshuye sof sof lo bala olam to halo nas nasa because she didn't work yet. El akshe lekushachrita, but they had a different way to reject it. They could have used that as a rejection as well. So, uh, so the the answer wasn't even really a good answer in the first place for many reasons. Amar Rav Yosef. Rav Yosef gives a different answer. Konamot karmarta? Wait. Konamot is very different from hektish. You want to ask a question from konam on a, on a case of hektish, two totally different things. Why? Konam is, like I said, you're forbidding one person, or it could be many people, but some item of someone's on yourself, or some item of yourself on someone else. So Rav Yosef says, Shani konamot mitoch sh'adam oser perot chavero alav. Right? I can take, okay, you would say like this, it has a greater scope this case because I can forbid your fruits on me. 
No, I can't go into your house and say, I can go into your house and say, listen, your fruits that you have in your tree, I will not benefit from them. I'm taking a vow. But I can't say I'm sanctifying your fruits to the temple. I don't have the rights to do that. I can only sanctify things that belong to me. So you can't ask a question from Konam from Konamot on Hektesh. Konamot has a much broader scope because I can forbid your stuff because I'm forbidding it on myself. So likewise, Adam Shalom. So maybe you could sanctify something, or here it's not really sanctified, it's forbid something. Shalom. So again, when she says, My Masay Adam are going to be forbidden to you, even though she doesn't have rights to them right now, since she might at some future point, she can actually make it a Konam because Konam works very differently. I'm only Abaya. Abaya says, I don't know what you're talking about. How does konam work? Yes, I can take your fruits and make them forbidden to me. I can also take my fruits and make them forbidden to you. But notice, I'm on one side of each of those scenarios. But yes, but you can't go two steps away from me. I can't take something that's not even in existence and forbid it to somebody else. Just like I can't go take your fruits and say, your fruits are forbidden to somebody else. I can't forbid someone else to eat your fruits. I can only forbid me to eat your fruits or you to eat my fruits. So t- taking something that's not even in existence and forbidding it to somebody else, which is what the case of the Konam, say I die to her husband, definitely shouldn't be able to do. So that answer falls as well. Answer number three, and this is the one that gets the most complicated because we're going to start with all sorts of comparisons to our case. Anyway, let's start with the answer, and then we'll get to all the comparisons. Ela Amar Rav Huna B'Leid Rav Yoshua. Be'omeret Yikatshu Yadai Lo Sehem. It's a case where she says, my hands will be sanctified to the one who created me, to God. Okay? Basically meaning, the husband, you can't have access to them. But what can't you have access to? My hands. Not what my hands create, but my hands themselves. And then, the Yadayim in Uba Olam. My hands are in this world. So while I might be forbidding what my hands are going to cause work in the future, I'm talking about something that's in existence right now. So it's not a classic case of Devar Shalom Bala Olam because we're talking about my hands. So then they say, okay, well, first of all, it still shouldn't work. They're dead, right? My hands, right, while I'm married, anything my hands produce, go to my husband. So I still can't sanctify it because they belong to my husband. No, she says is, my anything my hands do will be sanctified, meaning you can't use them, konam. They'll be like sanctified to God in the sense that you can't use them, she says to her husband, as soon as I get divorced. Okay? If I get divorced in the future, they'll be forbidden to you. And then there's the debate about Tanakama, Rabbi Yekiva, Rabbi Yochanan ben Uri, does this work? Okay? Is this valid or not? And that's where Shmuel holds the Rabbi Yochanan ben In which case, it's not a Devar Sheinu Bala Olam. Because she's basically saying, my hands, which are in existence, and what they produce when I have access to them, which will be when I'm divorced, will be forbidden to you. And that's the situation. And then, Rabbi Yochanan ben reads like this, nullify the vow, because when she gets divorced, and they'll be forbidden to you, that will mean you won't be able to remarry her. So, in your best interest, to basically nullify this vow. But this also is a problem because umi ikamidi, is there such a thing? Di'ilu, and as, could it work this way? Di'ilu hashta lo kadish ulakame kadish. Right now where she's standing, she's married to him. She can't sanctify it. They belong to him. So how could she sanctify something now for later when at this present moment she doesn't have rights to sanctify it? So it shouldn't work. Okay, to which I'm a Rabbi Eli, Elamalo, Alamalo. Rabbi Eli says, I don't know why you think this is a problem. I'll compare it to a case and I'll show you that you can, that you can basically sanctify something for some future point, even though you can't sanctify it now. You're going to see his comparison isn't great, and that's why the Gemara is going to say that's not a good comparison. So let's start with this comparison. If I'm about to sell you my land and I say, this field that I'm about to sell you, when I get the money and I repurchase it back, tikdash, it will be sanctified to God. So you're basically standing now. You actually own it now, but in another five minutes, you won't own it. And what you're saying is at some future point, right, I will. 
I will sanctify, right? I, when I will own it again, I will sanctify it. Milo Kacha, what, would that not work? Of course that'll work. If that works, that's just like this. But it's really not because our thing had time one and time two. Time one, she's married and her Masaya Daim aren't hers. And at time one, she stands and basically sanctifies something for a future time, time two. This has three times. Right now, when I'm standing here, I actually own it. What I'm saying is when I sell it to you at T2, right, time slot two, then right, I'll repurchase it back from you at T3. At T2, I won't have access to it. But at T1 and T3, I actually do have access to it. And I'm talking at T1, and I'm talking about a future point of T3. So it's not exactly the same, which is exactly what Rabbi Yirmiya says. Matkefla Rabbi Yirmiya. Rabbi Yirmiya says, Mi dame, these things are not similar at all. Hatam biadolak disha. This case, at this moment in the sale, he could, right? I'm selling it to you. I could sanctify it right now. But but in the case where I'm married to you, I don't have rights to sanctify that item because I don't have rights to divorce myself right now, right? I can't be divorced right now. I'm not, I'm not divorced right now, and I can't be. And I don't have the power to divorce myself either, right? That's always the problem with women, that they can't bring about their own divorce. Halo damya ella, it's more similar to a situation. La omer la chavero, sadez zo shemacharti lacha, la chisha eka chenu mimcha tikdash. It's more like someone who says to their friend, This field that I sold to you, that's a T1, it's already sold, right? They're minus T1. You know, it was mine, but it's not mine now. At this moment, I say to you, This field I sold to you a while back, which is not in my possession now, la chisha eka chenu mimcha tikdash. When I buy it back from you, it will be sanctified. Delo kacha. Now that obviously doesn't work because I can't sanctify it now. So that goes back and 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 um, clarifies the question or returns us back to the question, which is: You can't. How could she possibly sanctify something when it's not in her control to sanctify it now? How could she possibly say it'll be sanctified in the future? And it should, how could it work? So Matkaflar of Papa Midami. Papa says, no, no, don't compare it to the field case. The field is very different. Midame, they're not similar. Hatam gufa upero biyada de When I give you, I sell you this land, you own the land itself, and you loan and you own any produce. It produces. But hacha, and that's why I have zero rights to it at all. But hacha, in this case where I'm married to you, gufa biyada, who? My body's in my hands. And remember, my Masaya Daim comes from my hands. So, I, I, you only have rights, you as my husband have rights to my proceeds. But you don't have rights to my, my body's my body, right? Not just my body, right? My physical body. I'm in the, we always say, you know, your body's your own. But what I mean is that I have rights. You don't have all rights to me. You don't own me, right? This is, if we talk about marriage being a Kenyan, here we have proof that it's not an acquiring of her that he owns her. He doesn't own her. He has rights to certain things of hers. Her masaya daim, in place of that, by the way, he gives her food. It's not like he takes it, you know, for himself without any, any return to her. And her body is hers. And that's where the masaya daim are coming from. So halo damya ella, right? Everybody rejects the previous, but brings their own comparison. It's more similar to, and this is going to still go on a little while. We're going to keep having comparisons. It's more similar to this. And then the other guy said, no, 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 it's not really. And change it. Halo damya ella, and now we're switching to Amubet. Le'omer lechavero sadezo shemishkanti lecha. This field that I gave you is collateral. That's more similar. Because what's collateral? I say, you loan me money. If I don't pay back the money, take my field. Now, in the meantime, my field will be a collateral to you. Okay, take, what I really say, not take my field, I say, in the meantime, let's erase what I just said for a second. So in the meantime, use my field as collateral. What are you going to do? You take all the proceeds of my field. You deduct anything you've gained from my field from the amount I owe you. Either I'll at some point pay you the loan and I'll get my land back, or you'll deduct all of it until I have no loan left, right? So either which way you're deducting what I owe you from my produce. But the land itself still belongs to me. So if I say, field that I gave you is collateral. When I redeem it from you, it will be sanctified. That would be sanctified. And that would be comparison, a good comparison to the woman. Because the woman right now, her body's hers, but the man has access to all of the proceeds, right? Everything she makes. 
But when she gets divorced, it'll be all hers. And she's talking about this future point of divorce. So she does have rights to her body, just like the person, the borrower, has rights to the land itself. So that should work, which would answer our question. But Matzlaflar of Shisha, Bredor of Edi, Midami. Now these aren't similar. Hatam biyadolif dota. Hacha em biyadal agarishatzman. This is what we said in the beginning. She can't divorce herself. Whereas the borrower can pay back the money. It's in his control or her control. But this divorce thing is not in her control at all. So since she can't bring it about, it's not a good comparison. So she, in other words, again, the less light, if you can't, don't have control to bring it about, then you shouldn't have control to sanctify it. Halo damya ella, it's more similar to the following case. Lo omer lechavero, shadezo shemeshkanti lechale etzer shanim. I say, this field I gave to you is collateral for 10 years. I said in a, a time, which means right now and for the next 10 years, it's not in my control to buy back. When I, when I redeem it from you, this would work if I say, when I redeem it beyond the 10-year point, it will be sanctified. That's more like the Gerushin case, where now she can't have access, but at some future point, she might get divorced, she'll have it. But obviously, you might already get where Ravash is going to go with this. It's not the same thing. There, at least at the end of 10 years, the guy has the ability to bring about the redem right to redeem it, to buy it back. But, right, to pay back his loan in full. But hacha, but in this case, she has no power to divorce herself. So basically, we're back to square one with the question, which is, in the case of the woman who says, when, right, this will be sanctified in the event of divorce, since she has no control over it, and she right now can't bring about the divorce, and isn't divorced, and can't sanctify it, therefore, because it doesn't belong to her, Masayadim, how could she do this? Now, remember, we said that it was a case where she said, Maseh, right, Yikachu, Yadai Lo Sehen. My hands will be sanctified. So we dealt a little bit with that issue, that it's her hands except that she's not in control, she still shouldn't be able to sanctify something that she doesn't have access to right now. So, Wait a minute. Konamot are different. Now, different than what we said before, they're different in another way. Konamot are kedushat aguf. What is kedushat aguf? Let's talk about it in temple first. When you sanctify things to the temple, there's two categories. There's things that become sanctified, the body of the item, and there's things that just the value. So if I give animals to the temple, I sanctify an animal to the temple, it immediately becomes sanctified to Shad Aguf. I have to bring that animal as a sacrifice. If something goes wrong with the animal, then I have to leave it to graze until it gets a blemish, and I can then, depending on the animal and what it was, but basically I'm stuck. I can't redeem that animal, really. So until it gets a blemish and it's not able to go on the altar anymore. But if I sanctify my chair, then what I really mean is the value of my chair. I don't have to bring the chair itself. That's called Kedushat Damim. It only has sanctity in terms of its value. It's supposed to Kedushat Aguf, where the body of it is sanctified. Why is this relevant? We'll see in a minute. But Konam, when I say my fruits are forbidden to you, or your fruits are forbidden to me, it, the sanctity of it, it's not exactly sanctity, but the forbiddenness of it is in the body of the item. Why is that important? And this is a little confusing because Rebbe uses the language hektish and we're trying to differentiate between hektish and konamot, but we're differentiating between where basically on one side is konam and hektish, like animal hektish. Okay, let's say I designated an animal for me to pay back a loan. I said, if I don't pay back the loan, this animal will be lean to you. That's what we're going to talk about in a second. Okay, that's like the konam, which is different from the Hekdesh in our Mishnah, which was, he sanctified her salary. That's just the value. That's not, there's no, my salary isn't even an item to be able to have Dushat Aguf to it. So, Rava says, Hekdesh, Chametz, V'shichur, Mafki'im Mide Shiabud. We've seen this before in Yavama, which is, there's three things, that even if there was a lien on it, and someone else owned it, if I, I had rights to it, sorry, I didn't own it, but I had rights to it. Like, I use this to pay back a loan, whether it's Hekdesh, it was food, and I was supposed to give a, a Gentile the food. I said, take it from here if I don't pay back the loan. And then Pesach came, and it turned into chametz, and I can't own things on Pesach. So that, or I had an item designated an animal for me to pay back a loan, and then I sanctified the animal. Or Shichor, I had a slave, a Canaanite slave, that was dedicated to a loan, right? I said, 
lien, right? Take the, take the EVID if I don't pay back the loan. And then I sanctify the EVID. I'm sorry, I freed the EVID. All that, mafki in midei That removes the lien on the item. So that EVID, that chametz, that food, or the hekdesh, what I sanctified, is no longer has any lien on it. That means that if this woman came and took her salary, which was dedicated to her husband, Shuabad to him, lean to him, he has access to it. And she basically said, it's sanctified, right? Then it removes his access to it whatsoever, which means she can sanctify it. So it works. Now the Gemara is going to ask, wait a minute though. Didn't we say it's only when she says, when I divorce you, when I get, when you divorce me? So the Gemara asks, V'nikta shumehata. Mehashta, they should be sanctified immediately then as soon as she says it, because it's Mafkemi de Shiabud. So now we get to this in between thing, which is Almoa Rabban the Shiabud de Debal, Kiecha de Lo Tikdash Mehashta. The rabbis came in and said, you know what, we're not going to allow this though, because then she'll remove access to him, she'll have all this power to remove access to him to all of her monetary stuff. So therefore they said, well, yes, it's true that Konam is going to remove the Shiabud, but only after she is no longer married to him. And then it will work. And that's why this case of Rabbi Yochanan Minui is not the Varsha Lobala Olam. And it's not that it's not hers, right? It is hers. She can actually uproot the Shibud because it comes from her body. Her body is her own. She has access, right? It's, it's her Yadeha, she said, in my hands. They're in this world. They are hers. And how could they be hers? Because she can uproot the Shibud, but only when she gets divorced. Not, it doesn't kick in now, and that's because the rabbis came in and strengthened his position so that she doesn't do this to all of his stuff. It was a little complicated conceptually, this whole thing, and a little bit complicated uh, back and forth, but I hope you managed to get it. Okay, now we get to a very interesting thing, which is what work does a woman have to do as a married woman? Okay, what are her rights to her husband in the household? What are her household responsibilities? Very fascinating, right? Something, you know, probably every couple tries to figure out, probably changes over time, you know, who's responsible for what. In those days, the household responsibilities were really on the woman and the husband. It was his job to really work. The women worked also. I mean, that's the whole thing about the salary. But also they did a lot of work in the house. So what does she have to do? Okay, excellent article of Shuli Mishkin on Flashback. You can find it on our site about delving more in depth into the, the types of things mentioned in this Mishnah and categorizing them and, and all sorts of uh, worthwhile read. Um, if you're listening before Shabbat, maybe print it out before Shabbat. Elu salabala. These are things that the woman's supposed to do for her husband. Okay, you might cringe a little bit at this, right? And remember, different times and different things, right? This isn't, we don't necessarily, I mean, it's a good question. Do we hold like this, the halacha? You know, I don't know if you all are going to start weaving the thread tomorrow, uh, spinning the thread, sorry. It's going to come up in our Mishnah. So the first category is she grinds the, the grains into, into flour, she cooks or bakes, and she does the laundry. She cooks and nurses her child, her son, which really means son or daughter. Um, the idea here being, very interesting, that she has a responsibility to her husband to basically nurse the child. She has to make the bed, okay, which is a little different the way we make our beds, set up the bed. It truly has a good insight. She said, Matzala Omita is more something intimate between them. And it comes up, by the way, in Nida, in terms of things they shouldn't do when she's in Nida, she shouldn't set up his bed because it's an intimate act. Okay, I don't really look at making my bed as an intimate act, but again, I think it was a little bit different than the way we view it today. And that's spinning the thread. What if she brings a shifcha with her, right? These aren't necessarily jobs the woman has to do. What if she has a maidservant? She brings him with her to the marriage. If she has one, we can take the harder labor off the list. Next category we get off. She doesn't have to cook and she doesn't have to nurse her son. Okay, three, she doesn't have to do the bed and she doesn't have to do the threading, okay, the, right, the spinning. Arba, now at this point we've gotten rid of everything, so it's a little bit strange why there's a fourth. Arba, if she brings four servants, Yosheva Pekated, she sits right on this big chair. Very good Rashi here. Rashi's struggling with, well, there's no difference between three and four. So he says, very interestingly, 
Katedra, Lo titrach b'shvilo leilich b'shlichut l'avi lo chefetz mi baya l'aliya. If he says, go get me something upstairs, she doesn't have to go upstairs to get it, right? How many times are in our house and someone says, oh, can you go get me this? Can you go get me that? That's like being someone's slave, okay? So then even that she doesn't have to do. Rabbi Leezer Omer, afilu ichnis alo mea shvachot kofal asop etzena. She at least has to do the thread, the spinning of the thread. Shabbat alam evi'i, she could bring 100 servants, doesn't matter, maid servants. If she's not busy working, it causes her to end up in relationships with other men and causes all sorts of problems. If he takes a vow that she can't do any work, he has to divorce her and he's responsible. He messed up the marriage by doing that. Because it causes boredom. Okay, what's the difference between these two opinions that Gemara is going to get to later? Okay, we'll get to that not today. But you see that there was this concern that she not busy herself with something productive. Gemara starts off with tochenet zakadatach, but she has to actually grind it herself. That's super hard work. To which they say, ela ema matchenet. The language is no, no. Matchenet means she causes it to be ground, meaning she puts it in the millstone. She, you know, makes sure it's all, everything's set up properly, but the, usually it was taken by an animal around. That's how it worked, and that would grind the, the grains. Or else she uses a hand one. And then, in other words, meaning she uses an implement. She doesn't have to do it by hand. Our Mishnah clearly doesn't hold like Rabbi Chia, because Rabbi Chia, you're going to see, had a whole different approach to marriage and what the purpose of a wife was. Tani Rabbi Chia, ain't isha elali yofi. Okay, we don't really like that the woman should be serving the man. On the other hand, I'm not sure we like this either, which is, woman's there only for her beauty. Any work will, that will detract from her beauty will mess up, you know, what she's there for. She's there to be beautiful. She's also there for her children. What this means, maybe, well, if you work her too hard, maybe she won't be able to nurse her son. If you work her too hard, maybe she won't be able to bring up her children. She'll be working all the time. There's many, many ways this line can be interpreted. This is less that she shouldn't work because of the, she won't be beautiful or because she won't have time for the children, but more like her goal, you know, her, her not again, not her goal, but women should be nicely dressed and their jewels. Um, Betani would be another source, since it's really important to have the women be beautiful. Put on nice linen clothing. If you want her to look nice, make her elegant. If you want her to look nice and widened, this is like a thing I guess they thought was of value. Give her little chicks to eat and give her milk as she's getting close to the age of becoming a bogeret, right? Like when she reaches maturity. Okay. A little bit of a strange thing, what to do with it. Good question. I'm going to leave it aside because it's getting late. Umenika et bina. So now we have this, she's supposed to, one of her rights to her husband is to nurse the child, the son, or the child. Lema manitin deloke beit shama. This sounds like it's not like beit shama because the tanya, nadra shalola et bina. If she took a vow not to nurse her child, her neder is valid, and he says, right, she should immediately take her breast out from the child's mouth. She's done. She took a neder, she has to keep it. He can force her. The vow is not valid because she's not allowed to do that because she can't go against right, what her commitment is to her husband. So the neder is not a valid neder. So, right, like it's not even her right to be able to decide she can't nurse him. So he can force her to do it. Nidgarsha, only if they're divorced, then she has no more commitments to her husband. Eno kofa, so kofe, he can't force her. But in Miami Kira, if the child only knows her and won't nurse from anybody else, no tema schara ve kofa minikta mipna sakana. So he can pay her, and then he can force her by paying her to nurse the child because it's dangerous. But what do you see here? The Bechamai doesn't think it's one of the rights of the woman for her husband because he says she can actually vow against it. So the witch of the Gemara says, Afilu tema Bechama, even if you say it's Bechama, Hacha Bamayas Kinan, Kigon Shenadra, Hivikiem Lahu. It could be a case where she took the vow and he basically let her vow take place. He didn't annul it. He knew about it and he didn't annul it. And this we've seen before, Kasavre Bechama, Huno Ten Etzba Ben Shina. He put his finger in between her teeth, like allowed her to, to chew his finger, right? Bite him. In other words, he, by him, who's really responsible? Is it she who took the vow or he who didn't annul it? The Shama says it's his fault. That's why she can keep the neder because he basically gave up on his right. It was her fault for making the vow. And therefore, it, the vow is not valid. 
If that's the case, they should debate any case of anything. Rashi says, Nadrami lehenot mi lo v'kiema. And if she says, you can't benefit from me, and he allowed it, normally if she takes a vow, you can't benefit from me, we blame her, and she leaves the, wet, the marriage <coughs> without getting her ketubah money. So they should have a machloket in that issue as well. And it didn't say that. And is it his fault or her fault? And Beit Shammai Omrim, and Aminika, sounds like she doesn't have to nurse him. And it sounds like Amisha says she has to, so it really sounds like it's against. So it really seems like Amisha goes against Beit Shammai. And with that, we'll finish today's daf and continue this topic tomorrow. Have a great Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Shavuot Tov, if you're listening after Shabbat. We'll meet up on Sunday.